Oh, hi. I didn't see you there. Never mind that. Today we're talking about things that make a board game good. I'm not talking about any of the broad stuff like, oh, you need to make it this theme and it's gotta have these kinds of mechanics or any of the normal stuff that I use to rate board games in my videos. I'm talking about the little things that developers and publishers do to make their games more approachable or the physical games more enjoyable to have. The first one is player aids, and that can be extended to cards that you have in your hand or on your individual player mats. These can pretty much be done with games of any difficulty like Love Letter, Puzzle Strike, and Scythe. The next point is just simply that your text needs to be legible. Teaching materials in schools are supposed to be colorblind friendly, so why can't my games be? It's not that hard really either, you just look at the color wheel, pick a color that you like, and match it with the color on the opposite side. There's a reason that this tactic is everywhere, and that's because it's easy, it's distinguishable, and it works. These stand out to your players, your viewers of the artwork that's on it, that these are distinct, they are not the same thing. This isn't just text though, this expands into character design, logos, and print on detailed backgrounds. For text specifically, you're gonna need bold outlines, colorblind friendly colors, and dyslexic friendly fonts. As much as everyone liked to rip on Comic Sans back in the day, sans serif fonts, and specifically fonts like Dyslexia, which were made with dyslexia in mind, really help. This also just helps people who have bad eyesight, like myself. I mean, the reason that these videos take so long to record is because I can't even read. I have to squint to read my script. I mean, it's literally written in size 48. The next point pertains to inserts, and that one's pretty straightforward, so I'm just going to list some games that do it very well and some games that do it very poorly. The no's from me are Terraforming Mars, Letters from Whitechapel, Splendor, Betrayal, Mansions of Madness, and Sheriff of Nottingham. Some of the yeses are Bees, Blood Rage, Puzzle Strike, and Holy. This next one I'd basically just consider an extra yes or a, a very special note, and that's Canvas, which is a game that was recently released and backed on Kickstarter. Canvas has a sleeve basically that everything kind of fits into, and the back of the box has this really cool indent so you can attach it to your wall. This is such a unique idea and I love it. I found a post online where somebody was 3D printing the plastic pieces to adhere to all of their other board games so that they can hang them up that way and I'm waiting for them to post their .stl file so that I can tell my friend who has a 3D printer to help me out with my board game storage problem. And by problem, I mean I have too many board games. Has this ever happened to you? Wow, what a great game. Well, I guess it's time to put everything away now. Oh. Oh god, nothing's fitting back in the fucking box. Okay, so Etsy says that they have organizers, but it's not gonna be here for another 28 days. All right, we gotta burn it. What? The only way we can get this off of our table is if we burn it. All right. Like the old fart that I am, I bought a laminator so I could laminate the cards for my board games. This works incredibly well for games like Sagrada, where there aren't a lot of cards, or games like Love Letter or Avalon, where if one of the cards gets scuffed, uh, the entire game is ruined and you have to throw it out. For those that are wondering why I would do this, uh, laminating and sleeving your cards protects them. It's just a nice thing to have because it very much extends the lifetime of your games. Any little tiny card game that you would take outside, something like Koo comes to mind, um, you would want something like this. It's just nice to have that little extra layer of protection. Don't double bag it though, you're just asking for a ripping. This one isn't really a must have because it would be weird to laminate or sleeve cards like Wingspan or Terraforming Mars. Wingspan has those really nice linen finished cards, so laminating them or putting them in sleeves would just kind of detract from the value of the game. And just like Terraforming Mars and Sheriff, there is a shitload of cards, and laminating or sleeving them would take a shit ton of time or a fuckload of money. Even organizers for Terraforming Mars don't take into account the fact that some people might want to sleeve or laminate them. Luckily, the Terraforming Mars big box, which just got funded on Kickstarter and should be releasing later this month, as in March of 2021 if this video comes out on time, has card sleeves available for add-ons, which I got. Because I'm a slut for that game. It's really good. 
the review is going to be coming as soon as I get the big box, I promise. <laughs> Similarly to the last point, this really can't be applied to every game. First impressions mean everything, so if you don't have a good first scenario or no starting scenario at all, the game's kinda doomed from the start. As dumb as it may sound, to get into a game and to play it multiple times, you have to have played it for the first time. In my Mansions of Madness review, I really only go into detail on the first scenario because it's that important. And in games with high difficulty curves like Spirit Island, you definitely wanna hey, you should um <clears throat> do this before you get bodied. <laughs> An example of a game that would really benefit from something like this would be the uh, little um, lesser known board game by the name of Pandemic. To elaborate a little bit further, this point really only applies to scenario or legacy or cooperative games. It's pretty niche, I will agree, but I know a lot of people that have been turned away from great games because of a bad first experience. Now this is a slightly broader point than the last one, but it's still in the same realm. For games with a lot of options available to you at the start, like tableaus or engine building games, this is really important. Sometimes you just need a little push in the right direction to get started. Creating a quick start guide helps players turn their short-term goals into long-term goals and see how those connect and see why your game is really worth playing. Having players get oriented is super important, and some of the games that do this are Scythe, Wingspan, and Doomlings. Wingspan and Scythe both have these cards that basically tell you, hey, you should be doing this on your first turn, or you should be looking to play a bird that contributes towards your round goal, or in Scythe, it's use your character-specific power to kind of get ahead or move further. Doomlings, since it's such a short game, basically tells you, hey, just play whatever you think is cool, whatever you think is cute, you know? Not everything has to be the best card. Just go ahead and play whatever you want and you'll get the hang of it. Now, is this a quick start guide? Technically, no. But with the game being so short and so varying from the get-go, this is pretty much the equivalent of a quick start guide. I'm adding Doomlings into here because I want to show you how uncommon it is for board games to actually do something like this. That and I just didn't want to make another video where I simp after Stonemaier. <laughs> So not a lot of games do this either, and honestly I don't know why. Extra bags let you organize things in the way that you want to. With Clank, I have to section off cards by alternating them in face up and face down order. This reduces the setup time the next time I want to play, but it also would have been nice to have an extra bag or two, so I'm not searching for the goblin card that's in every game, or separate out the different sets of the same 10 starting cards that everybody gets. As far as spare pieces go, this is one I really wish was done more often, holy shit. Look. I love Sagrada. I have everything that's ever been made for it at this point. If I lose a single die, uno, un, un die, the game is ruined. I have to go buy another copy. These little bastards are small as shit, and with no rolling tray in the base game, you're bound to lose one. I swear if you're not careful enough, you're gonna have one of those things fly underneath a piece of furniture or have a pet eat it when you're not looking. In our playthrough video we did of the game, Jay and I had to have a kitchen bowl, like the thing that we eat out of, to roll all the dice into to make sure it didn't explode all over the table. And to think that a game that I've spent so much time and money on could just be ruined by one unfortunate roll or one roll where someone's just not paying all that much attention is uh, nerve wracking at times, especially if I'm like playing outside. And I don't mean outside like in the wilderness, I mean like on a porch or a patio or a lanai or something. Whatever, you get what I mean. I'm not going outside having picnics and, you know, playing Scythe or Blood Rage out in the middle of a forest. I'm mentioning seat order because in games like Letters from Whitechapel, the player who has the most experience with the game gets to play Jack the Ripper first, who then has to move to the other side of the table from everybody else. I get that's how the game is played, but it's kind of annoying when you have to determine that, you know halfway through setting up. Even the first player requirement is shit because when everybody's played it a couple times, it's gonna be really hard deciding who's the next Ripper. Mm. I'm just gonna go over some games really quickly that I think have exceptionally dumb first player rules. Sagrada is the last person who went to a church. Azul is the last person who went to Portugal. Azul Stained Glass of Sintra is the last person to clean glass. And they kind of just gave up with the theme on the third one in Azul Summer Pavilion, which is whoever the youngest player is. <laughs> Love Letter is the only one that's kind of on theme with the last person to go on a date, except if you're playing with the person that you went on a date with, or if you're playing with a group of friends who don't go on dates, uh, this might be a little bit difficult. <laughs> this last one infuriates me the most, and that's bees because it was the last person to eat a honey sandwich. Okay, well, 
me and my friends that I play board games with are all vegan, so uh, that's not going to happen anytime soon. And even before I was vegan, I can't remember the last time I ate a honey sandwich. What the fuck? Luckily, this isn't a huge problem because it's fixed easily by downloading Schwazi, an app that I talked a lot about in my bees and my sheriff videos. So when I was writing this, I remember that the bees first player requirement was like extra bullshit, but I couldn't remember if it was actually something as stupid as the last person to eat a honey sandwich. So I decided to go look it up. Well, uh, I just took the internet because I was already at my computer. I was already at my desk, right? Um, but I couldn't find the PDF for the manual. Every other one of Next Move Games games has their rule book in PDF form online, like scanned in perfectly, or you have websites that outline, you know, how all of that works. Bees does not have that. I looked up the rulebook online, couldn't find it. I looked at the publisher website, couldn't find it. And I looked at two how to play videos online before I finally just said, fuck it. I got up, I walked to the other side of this wall and I grabbed my copies of bees and looked at the dumbass requirement of eating a honey sandwich. I'm sure eventually I will make a video that is the flip side of this that's talking about things that publishers need to stop doing. You know, a video of don't do these things when you're making a board game. Not that it's gonna to pertain to any of you, it's just something that you should be aware of because if it has these things, you should run for the fucking hills. But we will cross that bridge when we get there. Ah, oh. so you made it to the end of the video. Well, what are you gonna do now, tough guy? What are you gonna watch another video? <laughs> Maybe you'll even click on the uh, Best of Octavian playlist up at the top. Oh, oh sorry, what's that? You uh, swiped it away on Reflex? Well, guess what, motherfucker? I got a link to it in the description. Oh, oh, oh what? You want more content? <laughs> what the fuck? Well, I do have a Kofi, a Twitter, a Twitch, and an entire Discord server that's pretty active. So, uh, oh, yeah, and the, the links are also in the description already. Well, I hope you have a great fucking day, and I'll see you in the next video.